Well, good evening. It is 7 p.m. and we are live. Welcome to each and every one of you. We are here at the church. We have a group here. We have a group in the wings online. And we will, as we go along, I'm sure, be adding to the numbers. It's it's kind of a different situation. Somehow my timer's going. I need to stop it. I don't know why it's going, but it's gone. And we have another one coming in. Welcome. We are so glad to be with you tonight. We are in our study in the book of Nehemiah. And I don't know about y'all, but I am so enjoying it. I just love to study it. I can see why someone would want to write a book, but I do. I love to study it. And I think I have some things to share tonight with you that, that you will probably see insight that you never really picked up on before. Doesn't matter how many times you've read the book. But before we do, let me just, first of all, begin to pray by praying. And then I'm going to share some prayer requests with you that after uh, after we have the Bible study, you can, you can uh, join us and we can knit our hearts together in prayer. We don't all have to be in the same room to do that, but we'll bring our hearts as one before the Lord. But um, let me just say before we begin that, that, I want to commit our time to the Lord. And, and Lord, as we open your word tonight, the cry of my heart, Lord, is that you would put wings to it and take it to our hearts, that it would become real to us. Lord, that we would desire, have that inner desire to walk it out in our lives, to flesh it out. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak, your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of us. Thank you for each one that would hear. Thank you for each one that, that would would uh, have that desire, Lord, to look deep into your word. And I pray above all that you have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so after we be uh, we get to the end tonight, we will turn it over to a time in prayer. But let me just bring some prayer requests that I have. Um, not too many new ones, but a few. But getting back to our church, we, we, we want to pray for our church body. We want to be all that we can be in the Lord. We want to, to be a going church. We want to be a loving church. We want to be a living church. We want people that come here that say, to, to say, you know, I just sense the love of God when we come. And um, I don't know where things will be with with the way the numbers keep going up, they're talking about making an announcement on Friday, um, the mayor and the Algoma Health Unit, as well as, as Mr. Ford. I don't know where all of that is going, but I do know that God is in control. We have some folks that we've invited to come out on Sunday morning. We pray that they, they get to come. And, and we pray that when they come, they sense the Spirit of God here. They, they want to be here because they sense His love in His people. So pray for our church. Pray for our city. Pray for the peace in our city. Pray for the prosperity in our city. And I'm not talking about... Uh, the gospel of prosperity. I'm talking about that God would bless those that desire to work and honor him and those that work for businesses, that he would bless those businesses um, and, and that he would protect us, that those numbers would come down, that we would really be conscious of, of all of that. And we would see those things coming down. And of course, pray for our our country, our nation, pray for our leadership, pray for those in authority over us, pray for unity. This, this entire pandemic has been so divisive. I mean, divisive in families, <coughs> divisive in churches and congregations, in businesses, in, in institutions. And, uh, in that vein, pray, uh, we, we just have, um, in the news today, I believe it was 13 staff members of our hospital have been let go because of their refusal to get the the um, vi the um, vaccine. <coughs> Pardon me. And so you can probably turn that down, dear. We come in tonight, and, the, and the, it was 60 degrees down here. So this thing here just speaks to me. But in any event, um, pray for, for you know, we, we have some close 
people, personal relationships that are among those 13 that were let go. And, and they're really struggling. They're really struggling on a lot of fronts. So, so we need to be praying for them. And in that same vein, pray for our frontline workers. <coughs> As our sister said earlier, you know, the schools, so many of the schools are being affected by it. People in our, our congregation are being affected by it through the schools. And, and we want to pray for our teachers and, and for our children alike. Pray for um, th those in, 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 you know, the police and the fire and the ambulance, frontline workers. Pray for medical needs. We have a number of things we need to pray about medically. We have... Um, Edith Norble, we want to pray that she continues to be strengthened. She was out on Sunday, and we want to pray that she continues to be strengthened. We want to pray for for um, Ellen Paquin, who is really struggling with a knee problem. We want to pray for Dennis Bishop, who also is is uh, struggling with heart issues and and so on. Um, Orvella, who also was out on Sunday. And um, she's struggling through and, and uh, powering through this injury to her foot. Pray for our elevator. We've got this elevator situation that, that uh, we're waiting for a part that is actually coming from France, if you can believe it, from France, you know. But they have gone to that extent so that they don't have to go through a third party because then the cost would be through the roof. So we're praying that that thing gets here quick because we have folks that really count on it and we count on it. So pray for our elevator because we desire to see those high and lifted up. No pun intended. Yeah. <clears throat> we want to pray for Eric Barton, who's going down to Toronto um, for heart valve repair and that is taking place on the 30th of November. And so pray for Eric, pray for the girls and his family as well as they struggle through this. And I guess that can be a, a, a tedious operation. I don't know, but we want to pray that the Lord would just bring a peace to it, that he would work through the doctors. And again, I pray for medical or miracle, whatever the Lord would use. Above all, can I say that we need to be praying for marriages and relationships marriages and relationships that that the people who are people of God just not a let allow the enemy to get in and and to to bring whatever kind of division into those relationships please be praying for those pray for those co-workers who struggle and we we just um you know we have no idea what what people go through in the workplace and, and um, you know, how, how we can affect those that we work with without even knowing that we have an effect on them because it's that fragrance of Christ that exudes from us as we are before him, as we seek him, as we grow in him, as, as his grace pours through us. We're only channels, channels only, eh? We're vessels. And so, we pray for that opportunity, and whether it's in the workplace or in school or wherever the Lord may, may bring us, pray for all of those things. But now, again, let me just commit our time one more time to the Lord. Lord, I pray as we open your word, I pray you have your way and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your Bibles, and if you're looking at one um, there on the table, it's on page 500 and, I'm sorry, 350. 354 Nehemiah chapter 5 and I got a note from somebody said are we going back to the shortest guy in the Bible well he's not the shortest guy in the Bible he's the second shortest next to Bildad the Shuhite but Nehemiah is um, where we're going tonight Nehemiah chapter 5 I want to read the first 13 verses and I don't always do that and the reason I don't is A, for time, B, you can read it on your own, C, we um, often go verse by verse as we study through it. But tonight, I want to read it through, and then we'll come back and we'll go through it. Beginning in verse 1, Nehemiah chapter 5, it says, There was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. 
For there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and our vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them for other men have our lands and our vineyards. And I became very angry when I heard that their outcry and these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. And I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now, indeed, will you even sell your brethren or should they be sold to us? Then they are, were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what are you doing? What you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury. Restore now to them even this day their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, also a hundredth of the money and grain and new wine and, and the oil that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus, may he be shaken out and emptied. And all of the assembly said, amen, and praise the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. Wow. Wow, let's take that apart. Let's look at it a little deeper. But before we do, let me just tell you about something. It was known as the great miracle of 1776. It was the fall of 1776 and the British were invading America. The British had sent out an armada to the States and, and it was unlike anything they had ever seen before. Day by day, there were ships that went into the harbor there in New York, so much so that one patriot said, it seems like all of London has been set afloat. <coughs> they were bringing in some 20,000 British regulars. But on top of that, the one thing the American um, a Continental Army feared the most was a group known as the Hikens. And the Hikens were a group of German uh, mercenaries. Well, Washington had his troops dug in and they were in the area that we know as Brooklyn Heights on Long Island and he had them dug in. But as those British troops began to unload and come ashore, they took a path that they had left unguarded. They took a path known as the Jamaican Pass, and they went through the Jamaican Pass through the night, and they slipped right by all of the American forces. And in one day's battle, they managed to rout the entire Continental Army. It was just short of a miracle that the nation the United States of America wasn't defeated right then and there because this was right after them signing the Declaration of Independence. It was just that that revolution that that was beginning, right when the revolution was beginning. Um, it, it was really a little short of a miracle that it didn't just end in disaster for the nation at that time. It was the genius of Washington who, in the middle of the night, moved his entire army back across 
the East River and uh, and back to the other side. And when he did, and when he moved them there, they lost the battle. Even though they had moved, they went to battle, they lost the battle. And then they, they moved over to White Plains and they lost the battle there as well. Then he did something that no general, they say, would would ever do or should ever do. And um, it was a no-no. And what he did was that in the face of superior forces, he divided his army. But he didn't divide them in two. He divided them into four groups. One of the groups he sent to Philadelphia, and that's where Congress was. And he sent them under the, the leadership of a guy by the name of Nathaniel Green. The second group he sent to Fort Washington, he wanted to keep the British from coming up the river there and, and taking them captive. The third group he sent off of the guy by the name of General Charles Lee. And then the last group, a little less than 3,000 soldiers he took with himself. Well, when the British Lord Cornwallis discovered that the Americans had, had been divided, that they had separated, he went and went after Fort Washington and they conquered it. It fell. And in one day's battle, there were 2,836 American soldiers that surrendered to British troops. But somehow, somehow, Washington began to outmaneuver Cornelius. I mean, just to keep the revolution alive, he began to outmaneuver Cornelius in hopes of saving what would be eventually the United States. But it wasn't the British forces and the one defeat after another that Washington won. That wasn't the miracle. It wasn't the fact that they had fought on and on and, and, and not only fought the battles against the, against the British, they had smallpox infected. It, it infected the entire army. And, and uh, it wasn't the fact that he, he couldn't get Congress to supply them. I mean, they're coming into winter. They needed blankets. He couldn't get blankets. He couldn't get money. He couldn't get soldiers. He couldn't get supplies to win that war. I mean, time and time again, he wrote and he asked, but they couldn't give what they didn't have. They had nothing to send. So it wasn't all of that. That wasn't the miracle. The miracle was this. It wasn't what the British were able to do to Washington. It, that wasn't what it was at all. It was the fact that he survived internal strife within his own army, internal strife. And we rarely hear of that when we hear about that battle. But you know, it became so bad that at the Valley of Forge, they became known as the lifeguard. And they were a group of Virginian soldiers who came to protect Washington. He was staying in a farm, uh, in a farmhouse in that in in at that time for that winter. And these Virginia troops came to protect them, and they were known as the lifeguard. And um, the problem was inner strife. You see, it was General Lee, this second in command. He was the only man in the Continental Army leadership who had any military experience. He had, had came from uh, uh, um, to the U.S. as a British soldier, and he settled in the U.S., and he became a patriot. But he was the only one with, with military experience. So when the U.S. decided they were going to declare independence from Britain, Washington, according to history, um, at the suggestion of Thomas Jefferson, became the commander-in-chief of the army. And they made General Lee second in command. But he always wanted Washington's place. He wanted Washington's position. And on the 13th of December, Lee was ordered to bring his troops to where Washington was. And in order to, to keep that part of the army from falling into to British hands, he was ordered to go and, and bolster the troops that Washington had.
But instead of doing that, Lee got up in the morning and began to write letters. He was writing letters of complaint to Congress. He'd write letters to other officers in the Commonwealth forces. He was trying to undermine the authority of George Washington. But let me tell you about the miracle, because you see, Lee had put his army um, three miles away from the inn where he was staying. He had some 4,000 troops and he had them bivouacked some 3,000 miles away, or I'm sorry, three miles away while he went to this inn to stay. And then when he got up in the morning, instead of following his troops and, and following his orders, he should have been marching his troops to support Washington. He was writing letters to undermine Washington's leadership when the British got them. And the British came on that inn and they took General Lee capture, uh, captive. And, um, you know, they had no idea what they were doing. But now, folks, if you don't see the hand of God in all of this, there's, you're missing it. You're missing it because the British had their focus centered on th this one who was creating havoc, who was trying to undermine Washington's authority. They had their focus on him. In the meantime, his troops got up and they went automatically to where Washington was to support him. But what I want you to see is that it was this whole concept of, in, of internal strife. You see, it doesn't just divide. It doesn't just decimate. It destroys whatever it gets a foothold in. And it doesn't matter whether it's an army, whether it's a government, whether it's a church, whether it's a family. When there is this this. Uh, you know, it's it really is a spiritual thing. It really is, but it's a submersive, a subversive, submersive, subversive. Uh, uh, you know, problem. This this inner uh, destruction that takes place, and um, you know, we've been in this study in Nehemiah for a little over two months now, and as we've looked at the book of Nehemiah, we we've made it all the way. To chapter five. And if you remember back in the first chapter, Nehemiah had this, this great burden to go to Jerusalem and to rebuild the walls. And it becomes such a burden that he begins to pray and he prays and he asks God, he, he, you know, and as he's praying and asking God what he should do, God speaks to his heart. And we see him in chapter two in this great political office where he's the cupbearer to the king. I mean, that's a great position. It's really a major counseling position. It's almost like a cabinet minister. And that's the position he was in. And we see how God works through the heart of this king, King Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes is moved by God. And, um, and by the way, we're told about this. We're foretold by prophecy some. 200 years prior to this, that this was going to take place. And, um, and so he, he goes and, and he's, he's motivated by God to give Nehemiah everything he needed to go and do what it was he wanted to do to rebuild these walls. And so Nehemiah goes back. And when he goes back, he motivates the people to come together and to rebuild the walls. Then in chapter 3, we see this guy's administrative skills to bring all these people from all walks of life, people from near and far, people who were jewelers and perfumers, and make them all into contractors to rebuild the wall. And then in chapter four, we see something that always happens when God's people decide to get off their blessed assurances and, and to really move out in faith, to take a step of faith towards what God has called them to do. And that is, they're going to face opposition. You see, when you decide to move forward in the Lord, I can assure you, you're going to face opposition each and every time. Now, we usually think that if there's opposition, that, you know, this can't be God's will. But can I tell you, I have come to understand that it really is just the opposite. If there isn't opposition, I'm leery. 
I'm leery about doing it because if there's not opposition, then then there's something up, you know, because as we've seen the last time in looking at this, um, we've seen opposition came through humiliation. It came through criticism. It came through ridicule. It came through intimidation. But when, when all of that doesn't work, it doesn't get its way, internal strife shows up and it decimates. And that brings us to chapter five. But now the question is, how do we survive internal strife without surrendering to its insidiousness? How do we survive internal strife and not surrender to it? You see, human nature, and I believe that that, that the reality is that, you know, if, if there's all of this opposition, if there's all of this criticism and, and it hasn't worked, um, we're going to get we're going to get um, internal strife. The thing to do is to walk away. Just let it go. But let me tell you something. I believe there's nothing worse than internal strife. You see, we don't have to worry about the, about what the world out there is going to do to us in here, inside the body of Christ. God has already given us victory over that. You see, I don't worry about what the world can do to us. But what scares the fire out of me is what we can do to ourselves inside the family of God. How do we survive internal strife? I mean, without surrendering to that insidiousness. Well, I'm going to give you two points tonight. And I promise just two points. There are a couple of sub points, but just two points. But the question is, how do I handle how do I survive? How do I deal with internal strife when, when you know, human nature is just to walk away? So let's look at verse or chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, and there was a great outcry of the people. Now, just stop right there because that word outcry is the same word that we see back in Exodus when, when the people of God are crying out to God to be set free. It's the same word that's used. It's a cry of distress. And, and it's a cry of a people who need help. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. You see, the cry wasn't against the, the opposition. It wasn't against you know, the the um, the world outside Sanballat or Tobiah, it was against the Jewish people. This internal strife inside the walls of Jerusalem was taking place against each other. They're rebuilding the walls. They're building these walls as a witness for God. But now, why are they crying out? Look at verse 2. For there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. Remember back in chapter 3, there were all these people who had left their farms, left their homes, left their flocks, their fields, their families. They had come from near and far, and they came to work on the walls. They had really walked away from their lives, and they said, you know, we've, we've done all this for the glory of God. And I want to tell you something, folks, because this is where we struggle. We struggle with the fact, God, we're doing this for you, and yet we're struggling. Where are you, God? You know, we've given all of this up for you. Where are you? Why are we not sensing your presence? Why are we not seeing your hand in all of this? And as believers, we struggle with that because we don't understand that these people are saying, we've left everything. Our families are hungry, and we don't understand where God is in all of that. But cheer up, because it gets worse. Look at verse 3. There were also some who said, We've mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. They had to deal with this famine that was going on, as well as the construction of the wall. And it was costing them everything they had. They had to do anything and everything just to put food on the table. They had to mortgage their land. And remember, 
Remember, no Jew was ever to do that. This is the land of promise. This is the land that God had given them. They weren't supposed to do that, but but they said, we don't have any option. Where, where do we go? How do we deal with this if we don't do it? But now listen, because it gets worse. Verse 4, there were also those who said, we've borrowed money from the king's tax or for the king's tax on our land and vineyards. You see, you got to understand, Nehemiah knows that this tax revenue has to get back to the king. And if it doesn't, the king is going to be coming after Nehemiah. He's going to think he's rebelling. And so he's going to send an army to squash the rebellion. And so the reality is this is very real. It is very real. They have to borrow money. They have to mortgage their homes and their fields. And now they have to go and borrow more money to pay their taxes. Now, they didn't have anything else to secure their debt with except to use their children as collateral. Now look at verse 5. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and our vineyards. There's nothing left. Nothing left. There's nothing else they could do. They come to the place where, where they have, think about it, they collateralize their children. I mean, that, that just blows me away. And, and, you know, you can understand the outcry that, that's coming from them. You know, they, 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 they have this internal strife going on. And it's all been created because one Jew, one person said, I don't care about you as a person. I don't care about the will of God or the word of God. All I care about is money. <clears throat> you see, whenever somebody puts money or position or power or influence or anything else for that matter over the will of God, over the word of God and above the people of God, it will cause internal strife. And I want to show you four things. There's four characteristics that I see in this passage of 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 someone that is willing to do that. And the first one is that they say they want to serve, but the reality is what they want is control. They, you know, sometimes people will step up and they'll say, can I, can I serve in this area? Can I, can I be involved in this? But you never find out until it's too late that what they're really after is control of it. They say, I want to serve, but what they really mean is I want control. And it's not that they don't have, a, 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 you know, a servant's heart. What they want is position. They want power and authority. And then that leads me to the second thing, because they're, they're characterized by their desire to manipulate people over circumstances, to manipulate people and circumstances. And that's exactly what's taking place here. They begin to manipulate the entire situation that they find themselves in. And then the third thing is you can almost never get them to sit down face to face and mediate. You can all, they will almost never be willing to sit down face to face. And that's interesting to me because I've seen it play out in my 45 some odd years involved in church. I've seen it happen so many times when there's strife, when there's a situation, whether it's a, you know, in, in any kind of a group or a function and, and, and there's strife that, that, that comes up. Usually the people that are behind the strife are evasive. They don't want to sit down and talk. But now Nehemiah is going to confront them. He's going to get face to face with them in just a moment. But before I get there, let me give you the fourth thing, because they almost always see another person's failure as their victory. When, when, when someone who is, is, is seeking to take control like that, seeking to stir the pot as it will, when somebody else has a failure, they'll see it as their victory. 
Now, if you want to see that take place in public forum, just look at the theatrics that we see. And I got to say it without chuckling, because look at the theatrics we see take place in the political arena. Look at, a, you know, I mean, case in point, Ontario, or, or rather Canada, in 2021 in the elections. I mean, it's crazy the things that they say and do. It becomes crazy what a person will do. You promise per people money and 15 seconds of fame, and they'll do just about anything. <coughs> <coughs> Listen, internal strife is created when somebody is willing to put money or position or power above God and his will. Now, I want to give you something, a little something extra in this because this is exciting. This is one of those, those treasures I like to dig up because something happens in terms of the chronological order of all of this that I find just just amazing that, that, that you know, um, some of the commentators like to say that this incident took place at a different time. But I am a literalist. When I read the book, when I read the Word of God, I take it literally. And when I read it, I take it just as it comes. And so I like to keep things as they are. But in chapter four, we read where they rebuilt the wall and they got it up halfway. They got it up to half its height. And then over in chapter six, we're going to see that the wall was completed in 52 days. And in the middle of chapter four and chapter six is chapter five. And the amazing thing to me is that chapter five and all that goes on in chapter five falls in between what takes place in chapter four and chapter six. That's amazing. But in chapter five, we don't read about any work getting done. Isn't that interesting? It is to me. Back in chapter one, it gets on his heart. He starts to pray about it. Then he goes to Artaxerxes and he gets permission he gets papers. He gets the resources that he needs to go ahead. And then he rallies the people. In chapter 3, he brings them together and they begin to work. In chapter 4, they face all kinds of criticism and ridicule. But the work continues. They build the wall up to half its, its height. And then in chapter 6, the wall is completed. But chapter 5 doesn't mention one word about the work on the wall. Why is that? Internal strife. Internal strife. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you do or, or, or what, whatever it is that you're involved in. Internal strife will literally shut it down every time. You see, you need to understand that internal strife is always going to come it's always going to come when somebody is going to decide that they're going to place something, money, position, power over the word of God, over the work of God, over the will of God, over God's people. If they're going to put it in a higher place than the will of God. Now, that's the first thing. Let me show you the second thing in about four minutes as I rush to get, get through this. How am I able to survive this internal struggle without, you know, totally surrendering to it. First of all, internal strife comes when we place revenue over relationships. But the second thing is we need to always confront internal strife. You can't just let it go. You can't sweep it under the carpet. It'll never go away. You have to confront it. And that's exactly what Nehemiah does. So let's pick it up in verse 6. And in verse 6 it says, And I became very angry. And I'll just stop right there because this is good stuff. Some people struggle with that. They, they, they struggle with the fact that, you know, it's, it's out of God's will to become angry. You know, can I tell you something that... I believe that there is a time and a place when God's people do need to become angry. 
when when you read about what David said in I think it was Psalm four verse four, and and Paul said it in the New Testament. He says, "Be angry and sin not." When I read that, it tells me you can be angry, but don't let it become sin. Be angry and sin not. And Nehemiah becomes angry here. I have a full collection of Francis Schaeffer's works at home. It was given to me by Rob Hodgkinson many years ago. And it's it's just a dynamite resource. But he had a son, has a son, Frankie. And Frankie Schaefer um, wrote a book entitled A Time for Anger, The Myth of Neutrality. And in that book, he says, now listen to this. There are times when anyone with a shred of moral principle should be profoundly angry. And we live in that time, he says. That's a quote. I'm not saying, I wouldn't say that. I'm much too mild-mannered to say that. But the fact is, that's a reality. But now, let me show you a couple of things about this. And I want to look at chapter 4 for a minute, because... I want you to, to know that nowhere in chapter 4 do we read that Nehemiah became angry. He's dealing with Sanballat and Tobiah. And, and, and nowhere in there does he say that he gets mad, he gets upset, he gets angry. You don't read it because he doesn't become angry. You see, he doesn't get angry at the opposition. But when you get to chapter 5, who does he get angry with? The people of God. The people of God. Do you find that interesting? That blows me away. It really does. I find that extremely interesting. He doesn't expect anything less from the people in the world, from the people outside. He understands. He gets it. He gets it. But what angers him is the people of God who have the word of God, who are looking to follow the will of God when they allow money to come between them, each other. It says in the book of Deuteronomy that no Jew, no Jew is ever to loan money to another Jew and to charge interest, exact usury is the words that are used. And I can promise you that each and every one of these Jews knew every word of that law. They had the first five books, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible memorized by heart. They could recite it. They could sing it. They could quote it at will. They knew it. But let me say that I need to say this with all the grace I can muster. Because this is a word for you and I. This is a word for us. Just to know this is not enough. You know, I, I say to kids all the time, is, is it better to memorize the scripture or to do what it says? It's so true, folks. To, to, to be able to quote this is not enough. You need to apply it to your lives. We need to get it into our hearts. It needs to change us. Anybody can memorize the word of God, but it's when the word of God grips you. You can read the word of God. Anybody can, but it's letting the word of God read you. That forever changes you. And it changes you to the point where you can't be around it enough. You can't get to it enough. There's never enough time to be in it. And then you really know, you really know God well, these folks knew this word, but they disobeyed it. But I want you to see is how Nehemiah handles them in all of this. This is really cool. He doesn't fly off the handle. He doesn't lose it. Look at verse 7. After serious thought, he doesn't just come out, you know, words spewing out of his mouth. He says, after serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I call the great assembly against them. He says, um, let me tell you something. He's first of all appealing to their conscience. He's appealing to their conscience. But there's another good thing about this, because if it needs to be done, it needs to be done publicly. 
And he says, you know, I've thought about it. I've given that careful thought and I confronted them. And then I brought it before the assembly. But notice he doesn't just unload on them. He doesn't fly off the handle. He, he, he loses it in the sense that he, he's angry, but, but losing it doesn't include him unloading on them. And what he does is to appeal to them. But let me show you how he appeals to them, because this is pretty cool. This is good. I like to say this is good stuff. He appeals to them, first of all, to their conscience. He appeals to their conscience. Now look at verse 8. Um, where am I? Here we are. And I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who are sold to the nations. Now, indeed, will you even sell your brethren or, or should they be sold to us? He's saying, let me tell you something. You need to understand that I have taken my own money, my own resources, and I have bought Jews out of Babylonian and Persian captivity myself. And now you're turning around and selling them back into it. You're putting them back into slavery. That is appealing to their conscience. But the second thing we see is in verse 9. And in verse 9, um, we see that he appeals to their testimony. Then I said, what, are, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations of our enemies? For crying out loud, he says. And well, he doesn't say for crying out loud, but to me it sounds like that. For crying out loud, your testimony is terrible. Look at what you're doing to your testimony. You're not walking, fleshing out God inside of you. You just do whatever it is you want to do. And then the third thing is he appeals to their witness. The first part of, of verse 9. Um, in, in verse 9a, well, i got to find it here. I'm in a paragraph, in the middle of a paragraph. And in verse 9a, <laughs> then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God? And then that that really is appealing to their testimony. Should you not be walking rightly before God, he's saying. But then he says, because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies. He's, he's appealing to the witness. Flesh it out in front of our enemies, the world. You see, what he's saying is that those pagans are watching you. Those who don't know the Lord are watching you and I. Those people that watch us pull into our parking lot every Sunday morning across the street and down the way, they watch us. They know. They know what we do. They know when we're here. They know when we're not. They know who is here. So now, as we, as we see this, we see him appealing to their witness what he's saying is that these people are watching us and and uh, they're watching how you are treating your fellow Jews. You know, and the fact is how we treat each other as our fellow believers is huge. And I can assure you the world watches that. So now what does Nehemiah do? Now we got to find verse 10 in this paragraph. He says, I also with my brethren and my servants and lending them money and grain. He says, please let us stop this usury. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves and their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine, the oil that you have charged them. And so they say in verse 12, we're going to give it all back. They said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And so then Nehemiah calls the priests. And you know what he's doing here? He's saying, I hear what you're saying. I hear you. I, I, I hear what you're saying. But I want you to commit to this. I want it in, in, in the form of a vow. And so we're going to bring in the preacher. And in verse 13, he brings in um, Ezra, the priest. He brings them in, and um, oh, this paragraph business is killing me here. And he says, 
All the assembly said, amen. He says, then I shook out of the fold of my garment and said, so many, so may God shake out each man from his house and from the property, his property, who does not perform this property, this promise. And everybody said, amen. Man, you make this promise. And if you don't keep it, God will get you. That's what he's saying. God will get you. And you say, where in the world does Nehemiah get off doing that? Hi, I'm glad you asked. Next week. We'll get to that next week, maybe. Maybe. You see, he slides that right there in the middle of all this going on. And why are they so agreeable? Why are they so willing? Nehemiah says, I've been lending them money. I've been giving them grain. I've been giving them whatever I could. I don't charge them interest. I've been giving them food. I haven't taken their, their land. You know, I, I sure haven't, you know, um, collateralized their children. You need to follow my example. You see, Nehemiah was able to confront that internal strife because he had that moral authority to do it. And that's the key, the moral authority. You see, people are not going to follow leaders that don't have a moral compass, that don't follow that moral compass, you know, moral authority. You you can step into a situation of, of internal strife when you have moral authority and you can speak to the heart of the matter. And when you read verse 13, all God's people said, amen. I want to close with an illustration that I love. I think over the years I've used this 20, 25 times in messages. This is amazing to me. It was in 1994, in February 1994, that a little old lady, a little old lady walked into the ballroom of the Hilton Hotel in New York City. And she was so tiny, she had to stand on a box to see over the, the podium. And when she stood up, <clears throat> Mother Teresa said this. She's speaking in this gathering to some of the most powerful people in the world. Listen to what she said. Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love one another. Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love one another, but to use any kind of violence to get whatever it is they want. She said, please don't kill the children. I want the child. Give me the child. I am willing to accept any child who would be aborted. That entire ballroom erupted into an applause. And everyone in that room, except for four people, applauded. And the four people who didn't applaud were the president and his wife, the vice president and his wife, Bill and Hillary, Alan Tipper Gore, the only four people in that room who didn't applaud. But I'll tell you what, moral authority made that little old lady who had nothing, she had nothing, but she had the moral authority to stand up to the president. Imagine, imagine. So as I close, I want you to know something. It doesn't matter how much internal strife you have going on in your life, in your home, in your work, in your marriage. It doesn't matter. You need to understand Jesus Christ loves you. And he's given you the victory over it. He has given you the victory. That's why he died. Just the just for the unjust. He did that to bring us to God. And until we come to Jesus Christ, the one who died on Calvary, the one who shed his blood and rose again the third day, until we come to him in full assurance of faith, trusting him as Lord and Savior, we can never, ever have a spiritual experience. Oh, you can have goosebumps or, or you know, you can have a religious encounter, whatever you call it, I don't know. But the only way to bring life 
to a dead spirit is to go through Jesus Christ and to have the Holy Spirit come into your life. And you can do it right now. Let me pray. Father, I thank you now for your word. I thank you that that it is so, so powerful and that it is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. Lord, as we look at this, as we look at this story and study the life of Nehemiah, how we see you working in and through it, how we see your your hand in, in, in these pages and how we see your word for us applicable today. Oh God, I pray that you would take it to our hearts cause us to thirst after your righteousness, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I've given you everything to pray for. We have fed until we're hot and we're sizzling now. Now let's go to war. And until then, we'll see you next time, either here, there, or in the air. I better check and see if I've got any prayer requests that I need to cover off. We have Sandra Miller. We have Matt Miller. We have Elvin Song. We have, we have, um, oh, Christian is there as well. And we have that group. We have another group over in the wings. And no prayer requests. So you guys can hang out. I'm going to sign off and say good night. We'll see you here, there, or in the air. <laughs>